a Grey Gumo. Now we're at kind of that point in Madhouse's career where we're in a sweet spot between the exploitation and art house. Some could call it pink film. That could be an inspiration here. That's definitely a subgenre of Japanese movies that we'll have to get into another time. But considering the ex Mushi Pro people working on things that were inspired by such a genre, um, yeah, it fits right in. Technically, this is a half Toei and half Madhouse production, but it was directed by Mori Masaki. And Mori Masaki is Madhouse. So, what we get in the beginning is a bait and switch. There's a single color palette. It's quite muted. The reds stand out in bleak contrast. The atmosphere is oppressive. The only thing you can hear in the sound design is the squawking of the crows. It's an intense battle, reminiscent of the snow fight in Lone Wolf and Cub. Then suddenly we hit the tonal shift, and we're introduced to that main protagonist. His habit of dancing around breaks the tone down from its stoic position, as we realize we're not in that kind of film. If anything, this is an intersection of several different genres, from the raunchy comedy to the period piece elements and the samurai flick style. They're all merging into a trifecta of quite an atmospheric movie. If you want to look at it anyway, it's like a day in the life of a very strange family. One of the first things you notice about Hagu Rei Gumo is his particular shape, his character design, obviously of a different age. The manga, long running as it was, started in the 70s and continued until about two years ago. Uh, not that you'd be able to find any of that online in English, uh, but I digress. His shape is peculiar, let's say, like a turnip. He's top heavy and his feet sort of dwindle down with a weirdly shaped sort of tuft of hair that he has tied like a root vegetable. Now, Hagare Gumo is the name of the main character, and it translates roughly to about wandering cloud. Now, if there's anything I could say about this character is that he's definitely very much the wandering type. There are so many distinct and different artistic pieces on display. Those background paintings have such a wild attention to detail. I'm almost convinced they must all be based on original paintings from the era. And the way that the characters live and walk through them which makes it like every frame is a painting. Especially towards the beginning. The shot composition, the shapes, the way they use the wandering frame. It's all mesmerizing. All coming back from that woodcut print style. Also known as Yukiyoe. A distinct art style that made up the Edo period. And that does a brilliant job of drawing you into this world. It's very alien to us, and certainly uh, things have changed quite a bit from the time period this was set in. So there is not going to be much respecting women, or respect for children, or general good habits. Our characters are sort of sleazebags, impudent brats, and toothless children. Everyone's a bit of a mess. And maybe that's a little bit of the appeal here, that we're not exactly dealing with the perfect family. Simpsons be damned. Now, another thing that is interesting about the Yukio-A style is the origins of the art came from a sort of Buddhist term, also known as the floating world. Birth, suffering, sadness, death. And considering that this piece is about the death of an era, the Edo era in particular, and the turbulence towards the end between those who are the nationalistic, that want to keep the country the same, and those who want to expand to a global market, also known as the, the Bukumatsu. You have the, the pro-imperial nationalist versus the, versus the shogun forces. There's a sentiment of anti-immigration, of uh, the detest of the West, closing the borders, which didn't last long, as the Meiji era did come into effect. It's a move towards modernization. The film certainly has an optimistic tone towards that outlook, even if you know in reality there's a bit of sweetness that comes with it. And that's along with the wonderful sound design and music from Seiji Yokoyama, who was a Toei composer working on early Harlock and uh, Dracula Sovereign of the Damned? Ah, so we meet again, Dracula. It's been a while. In fact, it's been far too long. I really enjoy the main theme. It has a sort of light-hearted, whimsical quality to it. Something that you can always return to. If there's anything you notice in this film, it's that there is a routine to these characters. You start to learn about the geometric setting of the town and the day-to-day -day happenstances of it all. I, I see where some people may have a hard time embracing it, but when you sort of melt into its mellowness, I think there's a lot to like here. 
despite some of its archaicness. If it is that sort of wandering soundtrack that mixes things like strings, whistling synths, and a sort of traditional with the modern when it comes to orchestral backing, to the relaxing nature of some of its scenes, next to stupid comedic parts, which some hit, some do hit, even if I, I don't know if they were supposed to hit in the way they do. You can become endeared to these characters, their day-to-day. If anything, the character that gets the most play would be Gumo's child, Shinosuke. You see Shinosuke becoming more a man, even if he's only like 11 years old. He grows throughout the film. This is very much his development. His dad is a, a steel pole in the ground, you could say, never moving even if he's always whistling in the wind. But he has to come to terms with fighting against bullies, finding admiration and a father-like figure outside of his own family and finding a calling in life and a direction that he wants to strive for. And that's pretty standard stuff, but it does help. The framing in this film is quite excellent. And certainly that may have something to do with a certain man called Kawajiri, who was hanging out on those storyboards. Now, this is early days for Kawajiri. He hasn't quite directed his own projects yet, but we'll soon see that come in the future. He really made his mainstay at Madhouse. And you may notice a couple of cheeky little scenes that are reminiscent of one of his later picks coming up. Yes, the movie has its own bamboo fight. Of course, it's not as long and as exceptional as a Ninja Scroll, but you can see the pieces come together. What I found different here was how they try to make it a more technical fight, at least at the beginning, in terms of the main dude himself, Gumo, having to use a long-ranged weapon that doesn't have much play in a field of bamboo where it can continuously get stuck. Although, like the tone for the most of the film, it falls down to um, a comedy bit. However, if there's one scene that doesn't fall into the comedy side, it would be the standout for the whole movie, where we get to watch real life, real life, activist of the political nature. His name was Sakamoto Ryoma. Introduced about halfway through the film, he was an eccentric chap who spent a lot of time in the new world, traveling around beyond the borders of Japan, where that was a dangerous feat. He spent his later years as a ronin of sorts. One of the most peculiar things about the man was that he happened to wear a traditional samurai outfit, but with western shoes. So you can spot him a mile away. He becomes a role model for the uh, young boy, Shinosuke. Someone to look up to, someone to admire. Someone that brings him hope for the future and the, the bright, wonderful, sparkling future that Japan may lead the way to. Unfortunately for some, his defining characteristic, at least in this film, is that he was assassinated in 1867. This assassination attempt is probably the most striking part of the film. It gets wild, drawing out of some sort of well, almost to me, seems like something you'd see in Samurai Jack. It uses these stark colours. You have the red, and you have the blacks, the purples. There's a level of magnificent abstraction. And the sound design is so keno that I don't even know how to explain it without just showing you. That assassination scene was directed by a completely different person, Moribi Marano, with Kawajiri on key animation. No wonder it feels like it's out of a completely different movie. But you know, that's not like a bad thing. It's a real life event that is accurately reinterpreted in an artful manner. Most of the attack did happen as the lights were knocked over. In complete darkness, he was taken aback by several assassins in the black of night. He died of the wounds suffered in the fight. The man would go down as a martyr, a visionary in some ways who dreamed of a truly free Japan. Someone who really bought into that all men were created equal uh, spiel from America. It's moments like this that make Hagure Gumo so special. At times it's just a very lowbrow chauvinistic piece that doesn't have the best taste. But at other moments when you start looking you notice some really beautiful stuff on the side. If from the framing to its backgrounds 
to the music and the occasional sparks of wisdom. Towards the end, there is a, a scene with dragonflies where the main protag here talks about life in a very poetic way. It's about dealing with loss, being the main character in your own story. You can idolize someone, but don't live for them. It's your life in the end of the day. And even in other small ways, the protagonist may be a bit of a prick, but he kind of does get some worthwhile bits in there. He has a very laissez-faire style of life, knowing that he doesn't have the longest time to live, so he should try and make the best of it. And that living by, living by someone's pride, like a traditional samurai, just will end in sorrow. My biggest concern of it, really, is that while the film has a sort of bookend, it ends in a bit of a half note towards the summary of a character who was only introduced not too long ago. I guess that's the issue of adapting a long-running manga, which has so many different stories and pieces, to sort of condense into 80 minutes. But I will say, my time spent here, it felt like something special. I could, I'm glad I could have had that moment in Edo with this family, even if it was only fleeting. Hey, 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 everybody. Uh, check out my Patreon, if you're feeling it. And... Maybe if I get some time, I'll make some shirts too. I'll be back tomorrow or the next day.